Power Jane from the Center for Responsible Leadership. Delighted to have a very special friend joining the conversation today on one of the most critical subjects, which is talked so little about plaguing our country. Deborah Gonshir Vinik needs no, no introduction, really. She is a diva, diva communications. As, am I fair to say maybe six Emmy Awards, as I'm told? And yet she continues to pursue with a passion things which are closest to her heart. Uh, we all know the opioid, the substance use, which has been plaguing our society. It's epidemic. The CRL has been engaged with the Clinton Foundation, Johns Hopkins, to address this issue. Deborah brings a special focus. She's focused on the people who get least attention, the females, the women. So Deborah, welcome, welcome. This is such a passionate subject, such a gut-wrenching subject. Tell us about yourself and this subject. What do we do? Well, I, I want to thank you, Bawa, for having me on to talk about this. It, it's really a pleasure. Um, it's not a pleasure that for this subject, because this subject is one of those things that um, is really uncomfortable for a lot of people to hear and talk about and address. And um, probably, actually many of the subjects that we have done documentaries on over the years have also been uncomfortable. Um, we, we've looked at domestic violence, we've looked at hunger and security in this country, we've looked at um, girls' education or the lack thereof, we've looked at problems that people perceive with immigration and asylum seekers. But um, this one is particularly um, difficult for people. And I think it's difficult for because people have over the years um, been led to believe that it is the fault um, of the person who has this disease. Now, I don't know of any other disease where um, people are faulted. So if you get cancer, generally people don't blame you and say, oh, well, you got cancer. It's something you did. Maybe in some cases with cigarette smoking, but many people didn't know uh, the impact for quite some time. But if you have um, you know, any other kind of disease, no one blames you. People try to help you. People try to work with you. And that's not the case with this opioid epidemic. Um, so people, first of all, blame the person who's the victim. And when it comes to women, there's almost no discussion about um, the terrific negative impact the opioid epidemic has had on women. You know, uh, what the subject that you bring up, I think, brings to my point. Just this morning, if you saw the State Department issued an advisory and flagging China and some Chinese and Mexican individuals in the ones who have been just pumping these opioids into our country. Uh, so it's a good step in the right direction to cast the, go to the root causes of it and why this happened. But I, I ask you, what is it that is missing in the public sphere on why people still don't get it that this is a disease? Well, you know, I want to start with, first of all, that answering that question and then specifically women. So it's hard to imagine. People say, well, look, the person knew they had pills, they took more pills, and they took more pills, then they may even... You know, you've heard the expression pill shopping or doctor shopping. So how, how could we say that they didn't know what they were doing or that they weren't the cause? Well, there's a very simple reason is that it takes very little time. I'm talking about three days to have your body become dependent on opioids. Um, so a doctor may give somebody a prescription because they have legitimate pain, whether it's from a knee 
injury or back injury or teeth. You know, that's one of the number one times when opioids are given. And so you take these pills because you don't want to have this pain. And then on the fourth day, you don't really have the pain, but you don't feel so good either. So you think to yourself, well, you know, maybe I'll just take another pill and I'll <clears> feel better. And you do feel better, but it's not because it's addressing your pain. It's addressing the changes that are happening in your body. And your body is really starting to go through a little bit of withdrawal if you don't give your body that um, opioid. So you keep on taking it just to stave off withdrawal. And six days, seven days later, you're taking a couple of pills more, not to get high, just to feel the way, the same way you always feel. And then it's more and more and more. And you're down a path that you, you, you literally cannot do anything about. Yeah. yeah. You know, I want to take us to your film, which is to be launched this weekend. And so it's nice that we could have this conversation as almost like a, a premiere. Yes. What is to follow. So tell us about the film itself, because you focused on, was it five subjects, five specific cases and the experts. And what, what is your, you know, what is it that you would like to tell people about this film? Well, the, the film is actually a documentary in two parts. So part one, as you said, correctly starts airing in uh, on ABC affiliated stations uh, this Sunday, which is June 4th. And then it airs certain stations that day, some other stations the following week. People would have to check their local listings to see um, when it airs. It's called Listen to the Silence, um, Women Trapped in the Opioid Epidemic. Um, and what, what I noticed when I started working on this, which was four years ago, is that nobody was talking about women. And, and four years later, that's still the case. I mean, I'm as shocked as anyone else that this is the first documentary that is focusing on women and the only documentary focusing on women. Um, and I understand that in terms of death, um, more men have died than women, but that still means that we've lost 200,000 women since 2000. That's 200,000 women. That is an astonishing number. And those women are our sisters and our mothers and our daughters um, and, and our children. And um, it's affected us all. And if we don't make some changes, it will continue to affect us for generations to come. Because if you're a pregnant woman and you don't ha have or can't get the resources um, to go into recovery, some states will take your child from you when um, your child is born. Um, other states will let you stay with the child, but then there'll be all sorts of repercussions down the road. So we're visiting this on generation upon generation. And there are insufficient resources available for women. It's as simple as that. It's like a mic drop. There are insufficient resources for pregnant women, for parenting women, for younger women, for older women. The resources are not there. You know, what struck me was in the film, uh, as privileged to view, is that you allude to that all the testing that the drug companies do are always on the males and not the females. I said, oh my God, how do women get into this discussion and get the treatment they deserve, they need? Exactly. Well, in, it wasn't until 1993 that there was actually a federal mandate that women had to be included in um, clinical research and trials. Up to that point, women didn't have to be included. Um, so that means that many of the drugs that were tested prior to 1993 may not 
never have been tested on women. The idea was people thought, well, women are just smaller men. So in terms of dosing, they would just go, well, if a man weighs 190 pounds, a woman is just like him, but she's only 120 pounds, so we'll just cut the dosage. But that is completely incorrect. I mean, a woman's whole physiological makeup is quite different than a, a, a man. And so once again, we're still seeing the um, implications of not having that research. Um, and it's 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 years since. What do you hope to accomplish with this film? Oh my. It, what I what I really hope to accomplish is I would love it if people who saw the film actually started thinking about this what $54 billion of resources looks like. So what happened in this country, and many people might know or have heard, is that the opioid makers who were promoting these drugs um, were sued by the state's attorneys generals. And um, there was 50, there is $54 billion for of opioid litigation settlement money. So now there's that big chunk of money. And I have to be honest with you, I can't even wrap my head around $54 billion. But that money is basically divided among the states. And each state has money and they will be getting money for the next like 17 years. And each state is supposed to figure out the best way of using that money to deal with the opioid epidemic. What I hope people seeing this film will do is to make a call to their elected official and ask them what's happening with the money. What's happening with it? Where is it going? And to make sure that a certain amount of those resources go specifically for women you know, who are suffering from opioid use disorder. Uh, what strikes me is that uh... I guess the big culprit in this is the big pharma, right? They've had record settlements. Where do those settlements go? Don't, doesn't it come to treat the people who are you alluding to, the women or even the men who are affected? Well, that's it. All of this money, it's, and it's not only big pharma, it's the retail stores as well, because you know that many of the pharmacy chains, they knew that they were you know, doling out huge, huge numbers of, of pills. Uh, but unfortunately, finances um, reigned. And now we're all, you know, very much harmed. Um, so I would hope people would care enough to, um, it's the people's money. So I would hope everyone would make a call, that's all it is, and call their elected official and say, where is this state's money going? Who's in charge of it? And there needs to be a portion, a significant portion given for women's resources. So we know certain things. We know that uh, a large number of women who um, suffer from opioid use disorder have also experienced trauma. We know that this is genetic. So if you have a propensity for addiction in your family, it could be alcohol, it could be um, another kind of drug, um, you're at a higher risk. Well, what are we doing to deal with that? And what are we doing for women who are pregnant? And how are we making sure that they feel that they can go into recovery without fearing that their child will be taken from them. Yeah. We, we, no, right I, now, we don't have the resources. Yeah, no, I, when you mentioned, I know that, that all these companies, whether it was Duane Reed or CVS or Walgreens or Walmart, every one of them, I think, has made massive settlements. Yes. Of course, the drug companies, again, you know, what you know what happened with, uh, with Purdue and the Sackler family. I, I just, where is the commitment of the elected officials on this subject? 
that um, it is absolutely unclear where the money um, is going. And so it might be frustrating for people to not immediately find information. And I would urge them, I would actually beg them to not give up this fight and to really try to track it down because it's, it's, you know, money that's going to all of our states and, and we have the right to know where it's going and to make sure it's being used for yeah. the benefit of the people. Yeah, you know, what strikes me and is appalling is that uh, how little people know about this subject and they don't know what to do about it. There is such a stigma around this subject the moment Absolutely. we discuss it. And there is no accountability, it seems, from anybody. That's right. And so I hope that your film will have that impact of getting people's awareness. Because after all, I don't think that we are trying to name and shame anybody. All we are saying is this is a serious disease. People, let's do something to provide the help that these people need. Absolutely. I, I, and, and the stigma, I'm glad you brought that word up because I think the stigma is really, um, it's immobilizing. Um, people feel so much shame that they don't want to um, let anyone know they have a problem. They don't want to, um, you know, and if you have, you know, as I keep on saying, or I said earlier, if it's a disease, why should you feel so ashamed that you have a disease, but you don't want to tell somebody that you're taking, that you've, you know, you've gone from four pills a day to eight pills a day to, in one case in the film, um, one of the women talks, she was, you know, taking 36, 37 or more pills a day, six at a time. Um, and and she got that. access to those pills by just stealing the prescriptions even, or just the prescription just being filled. Right. I mean, I think that at the point, at the point that she was taking that many pills, she knew that um, something was clearly wrong. And she was doing yeah. things like doctor shopping and finding, um, you know, people who were not looking at other people's charts and giving her multiple, multiple prescriptions. Um, but I go back to, I, I recently spoke to a friend of mine I hadn't seen in a while, and he told me that he had had back surgery and it was pretty serious um, surgery and they gave him in the hospital um, opioids. And um, on the third day, um, after the third day, he didn't take the pills and he really had to be weaned off. And he said his words were, that was actually more painful than the back surgery. So weaning him off of three days of opioids and the pain he felt from that withdrawal was worse than back surgery. You can understand why people um, continue to take it because um, they just don't want to feel that pain. Yeah, no, Deborah, what strikes me, uh, and you know, I'm just uh, talking loud is, is it possible for our healthcare system, the doctors, to stop prescribing these opioids? Or is it so much in the system that you just can't get, get it out? I think that I, you know, I think that there is so much in the system. I, I mean, I know when I go to a doctor um, and, or for my teeth, my first thing is whatever, you know, I don't want opioids. I mean, my first thing is even if I have pain, if it's a wisdom tooth or whatever, don't give me opioids. I, I don't, I don't want it. But I do remember not, you know, a number of years ago that I was given a prescription for opioids that probably was far more opioids than I needed. Now I think it's, you know, when I say I don't want opioids, somebody will say to me, well, I was only going to give you two pills. I, I don't want any pills. But certainly there was, they were giving huge bottles, 90 day 
you know, 90 days of opioids. I mean, you know, it's, it's mind boggling. And one of the things that the mother of one of the uh, women in the film says that once you get on pills, then when the pills dry up, people don't go, well, I no longer have pills, so I'm going to go into recovery. No, they look for something to replace the pills, and that's heroin. And, th and then, then that's down a whole other path, which is just even harder. It, uh, it is all down a very precipitous path. Yeah. And to me is... Uh, what can we do? What can anyone do? What can someone do? Well, I'm, I'm going to say the first thing is that something that happened with this film, and that is I did focus groups and show the film to... Um, groups, a couple of groups around the country. And amazingly, a quarter of the people who saw the film said to me in, bo in both groups, far, far away from each other, so they couldn't have been, quote unquote, looking at each other's notes. Um, but a quarter of the people said to me, they said, Deborah, I have to tell you the truth. For the first 10 minutes of the film, I just sat there with my eyes wide open and my mouth dropped because I had no idea this was even an issue for women. They had no clue. And I said, I understand it because when you look over the number of articles or the number of uh, pieces written, by and large, you will hear stories about the opioid epidemic and you will have examples of unfortunately young men who passed away um, due to an overdose, but you very rarely, if ever, I can cite three different articles last summer in the New York Times, there was no example of a woman. So why would anyone realize that this is um, an epidemic that has hit women and it's an equal opportunity epidemic? You can be rich, you can be poor, you can be black, you can be white, you can be young, old. It doesn't matter. It, you know, is really impacting all women. And so that's the first thing I want people to realize. This is, this is something that is, it's not for other people. It can happen to anyone, anyone who starts taking these pills. I would also say, the importance of naloxone, which people now know at, under the brand name Narcan, but naloxone is really a, um, a life saver. So I tell people that they should carry it, even if they think to themselves, well, where am I going? When is it ever going to be? You never know, because now fentanyl is cut into so many things that people who are not doing pills on a regular pay basis, maybe they're smoking pot. Well, if they're smoking pot, pot is now sometimes laced with fentanyl. So you didn't think that your son or daughter or, or neighbor's daughter would have a problem. And now she is overdosing and naloxone can really can bring her back to life. So, you know, I always talk about, I believe that should be federally mandated, that naloxone is in every single building, every public space, whether it's a church, a mosque, a synagogue, Walmart, the library, every building on a university campus, not one building, but every single building, there should be naloxone. It should be there all the time. We have to make some, we, we can't lose all these people. If there's an opportunity to save their life, we must take it. I would say amen to that. <clears throat> I hope that we can build enough momentum and a movement uh, that this film is the foundation for that as a basis to get this conversation going. This has been just so eye-opening and really tears my heart to hear all these statistics in the film and what you allude to. So 
let's see what we can do, Deborah, together. Absolutely. See that we can make this a movement and get the people the help they need. So thank you so much for coming on and willing to share. And now we're looking forward to the next steps on how people actually start to understand, people start to take action, because taking no action means you are complicit. Do something, do something. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I, I can't speak enough about your support. And, and everyone who sees this, I just hope they'll just take um, some time to watch the film if, it, if they can see where it is in their local area and really reach out to their um, legislator and ask the question, who is in charge of the, these monies that we know the state has, how they're being apportioned, let us know. Lovely. Onwards. Onwards. Let's do it. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks so much.